Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis and this is our series of lectures about bleeding and coagulation disorders. In the previous video, we have talked about the P2Y12 receptor inhibitors, aka ADP receptor antagonist. In this video, we'll talk about the GP2B3A receptor inhibitors, which inhibit platelet aggregation and prevent thrombosis. With that being said, now let's get started. As you know, the platelet has a plasma membrane, which it has got from the megakaryocyte, and a cytoplasm, which it has stolen from the megakaryocyte. Plasma membrane is covered by a glycoprotein coat. All of the receptors are part of this glycoprotein coat, and GP2B3A is no exception. Your cell membrane is made mostly of proteins, and receptors are proteins. Cell membrane proteins are divided into integral proteins, which take the whole freaking thickness of the membrane, as well as peripheral protein, which are just attached to one surface. Receptors, most of the time, are peripheral, meaning they are just attached to one surface. However, there is a great exception known as the integrins. Integrins, I-N means protein, no kidding, because all receptors are protein, but the integrins are... are transmembrane protein they take the whole thickness of the membrane and they facilitate cell extracellular matrix adhesion adhesion because as you know the gp2b3a will help the platelet adhere to the next platelet and this process is known as platelet aggregation hemostasis has many steps including the temporary plate plug also known as primary hemostasis and when we talk about the GP2B3A receptor, it's part of primary hemostasis. The GP2B3A inhibitors inhibit primary hemostasis. In other words, they inhibit the platelet plug. When you have no platelet plug, you have no blood coagulation, which is the next step. I've talked about platelet plug in previous videos, and I even have a mnemonic in a video, and you find it in this playlist called Bleeding and Coagulation. So please subscribe and save this playlist. Platelet plug in brief, platelet adhesion, platelet activation, platelet aggregation. First, the platelet adhere to the subendothelial collagen thanks to GP1B receptor, then platelet activation. The platelet starts going crazy and secretes two whistleblowers, thromboxane E2 and ADP. ADP start whistling to the receptors called ADP-dependent expression of GP2B3A, and we have explained this in previous video, and this is the story of the P2Y12 receptor. Now we have an active GP2B3A receptor. This platelet has one, this platelet has one, it helps with platelet aggregation. When you have platelet aggregation, you are ready for the next step, which is blood coagulation. GP2B3A inhibitors will inhibit these nice receptors, therefore no platelet aggregation, therefore no blood coagulation. I've talked about the P2Y12 receptor in the previous video. I'm not going to repeat myself. And here is how this P2Y12 works. Please watch my previous videos. GP2B3A receptor is the old name. The new name is integrin alpha 2B beta 3. What a great name. It's an integrin, remember? It's a receptor that takes the whole freaking thickness of the cell membrane. So in your exam, Sometimes, if they want to trick you, instead of saying GP2B3A, which most of you have heard of, they will tell you about the integrin alpha 2B beta 3, and then all of the students, oh my gosh, I've never heard of this. It's the same freaking thing at GP2B3A, honey. Same thing. Professors are just like, they want to seem smart. They would love a gotcha moment. They are integrin, complex on the surface of the platelet, a receptor protein that takes the whole thickness of the membrane. It's a receptor for fibrinogen and the von Bitter brand. Yes, it's a receptor for fibrinogen. It's just not two molecules, just one molecule. Sorry about that. The fibrinogen is this is then converted into fibrin fibers, and then the ripple cells are trapped, and this is the secondary hemostasis. So they are receptor for fibrinogen. No kidding. They aid in platelet activation and aggregation. Yes. The GP2B3A receptor is formed via calcium-dependent association of GP1B and GP3A. That's how you get this. 
You have a GQ coupled receptor, which loves calcium. Calcium is released from the endoplasmic reticulum. Calcium helps this, these two come together, forming one thing called GP2B3A receptor. Sorry, I made a mistake. This is GP2B, so 2B and 3A. Because 1B is involved in adhesion, not in aggregation. This nice GP2B3A receptor is defective in cases of Glenzman thromboasthenia or thrombosthenia, GT. This receptor is targeted by O2 antibodies, which are antibodies against the cell because the body goes crazy and attacks itself. Targeted by these O2 antibodies in cases of immune thrombocytopenic purpura or RTP. The same freaking receptor is targeted by different medications, collectively called GP2B3A inhibitors, which is the topic of today's video. Apsiximab, tyrofiban, eptifabetide, roxifiban, and orbofiban. Who named these things? The 6E abs, abciximab, the tyrant ban, tyrofiban, the epiphanic tide, eptifabetide, the Roxy, Roxifiban, and the Orphan, or Bofiban. Just some mnemonics to mitigate human suffering. So let's start with the 6 ab I mean ab 6 mab It ends in MAB, which means it's a monoclonal antibody. It's an antibody against one thing and one thing only. Okay, since it's an antibody, we literally made it from a piece of an antibody called the FAB domain which is near the antigen binding site. Because if this is your antibody, heavy chain is dark blue, light chain is light blue. Genius. Here you have a hinge like the one in the door of your car, and here you have a disulfide bond which is not present in your car. This is the antigen binding site, and this binds to the cell, being the white blood cell or the macrophage or whatever. This is the FAB domain, and this is the FC domain. Just all of immunology and two minutes. Okay, it's formerly known as C7E3-FAB. It's made of FAB fragments, but I thought that it's called Apsiximab and it should be a monoclonal antibody. Yes, honey, the FAB is part of the antibody. Okay, got it? All right. It's a GP2B3A inhibitor, therefore no platelet aggregation, therefore no blood coagulation. Apsiximab has a short half-life. Uses. If, it's, if it has short half-life, we'll use it in short-term prevention of thrombosis in case of acute coronary syndrome, which is an umbrella term that includes unstable angina, non-STEMI, and STEMI. Watch my previous video to know more. PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention with or without a stent. You try to poke this clot, baby, poke it. But then after the procedure, after you send the patient to the floor or to home or whatever, uh, he can form another clot, which is awful, so add apsiximab to prevent future clot formation. There is a famous combo, we use apsiximab with aspirin with heparin, because not. McDonald's is not the only one that has a combo. What are the adverse effects of this apsiximab? It's irreversible. Unlike your sexy abs, you have to go to the gym to maintain it. Apsiximab is irreversible. Bleeding is a side effect. Yes, if you inhibit platelet aggregation and blood coagulation, you'll bleed. You can't have it both ways. If you inhibit platelet aggregation, you're gonna bleed. Because in life, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. Apsiximab can lead to thrombocytopenia. When you have thrombocytopenia due to apsiximab, the solution is to give platelets. Back to our antibody story, the FAB is fragment for antigen binding, FAB. The FC is fragment of crystallizable or the crystallizable fragment. For example, if it's digested by pepsin, which digests protein, because this is a protein, we'll call it pepsin FC, pepsin fragment crystallizable, because pepsin has crystallized this fragment. PFC. Not to be confused with Pennsylvania fried chicken. <laughs> if you are in the United States and you want to get some good fried food, go to the South, man. These people have figured out how to fry stuff. You know, they fry everything. There's a reason KFC started in Kentucky. It's not just random luck, man. Is, by the way, is Kentucky considered South or Midwest? I'll leave this to the geography professors. But for fried chicken, you don't want to go to Pennsylvania. These people don't know how to fry anything. 
They are just good at discovering the Philadelphia chromosome as well as contracting histoplasmosis. My medical jokes are awesome. I'm sorry, guys of Pennsylvania. I'm sorry. What's the Philadelphia chromosome? Okay, watch my video on CML. The Philadelphia chromosome is 922 translocation, BCR enabled fusion gene producing BCR able fusion protein. You can see it mostly in CML and sometimes in ALL. It carries relatively good prognosis for CML because we'll throw imatinib at you, but it carries poor prognosis for ALL. Leukemia review in 10 seconds. You're welcome, baby. The tyrant ban, terophiban, it's a tyrant. It's derived from a snake venom, actually. Ooh, you give it by IV infusion. Ooh, it's a GP2B3A inhibitor, therefore no platelet aggregation. Ooh, therefore no blood coagulation. Ooh, look at this snake with the bifid tongue. Where I went to school, we call this a congenital anomaly. What are the medical uses of the tyrant, terophiban? Short-term prevention of thrombosis in acute coronary syndrome, which includes unstable angina, non-STEMI, and STEMI. Percutaneous coronary intervention with or without stent, same thing as apsiximab. Adverse effects, irreversible, can cause bleeding, thrombocytopenia, and allergy. Tyrofiban's effect can be reversed by stopping the infusion immediately and dialysis when the bleep hits the fan. Sorry guys, I made a mistake. Apsiximab is irreversible, but tyrofiban is not, because I've just told you that you can reverse it by stopping the infusion as well as dialysis, so stop it. Stop it! The epiphanic tide, eptifabetide, GP2B3 inhibitor, therefore no platelet aggregation, therefore no blood coagulation. Short half-life, short-term prevention of thrombosis in ACS, percutaneous coronary intervention, again, the side effects are bleeding. The most common type of bleeding is GI bleeding. It can also lead to thrombocytopenia as well as renal insufficiency with this epiphanic tide called eptifabetide. What if you have a patient with renal insufficiency and you want to give them a GP2B3A inhibitor? Don't give them eptifabetide, give them apsiximab. Okay. Eptifabetide, is this bleeding irreversible or reversible? It's reversible. How to reverse it? Stop the infusion, dialysis. These guys called Picmonic, they have great mnemonic in pictures about medical stuff and they even have a Picmonic about this topic which is GP2B3A inhibitors. Check them out, the link in the description. Believe me, you will never regret it. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe and join the tribe. Hit the bell to get notified. Follow me on Facebook. I have more than 95 cases there. I have even more cases on Patreon as well as you get all of my notes in PDF form. Like these, this lecture, you can just download the PDF and it's yours forever. Thank you guys for watching. This is Medicosis Perfectionals. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard.